Okay, so we are ready to go. <laughs> so I always still have to struggle with this every time. Um, okay. So tonight, it's 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 an open floor, like I said. Um, <laughs> it's one of those nights that I just want to sit back and let's have um, let's have a conversation because personally, I don't believe in just continuing to have inputs without some level of outputs. So we're going to I'm going to basically be facilitating. I'm not going to be teaching anything this night. Um, we're going to be hearing from, from everybody as much as time permits us. And then we have um, four people who are going to be talking to us tonight. Um, let me put this on uh, slideshow. So the, the, reason, the reason I'm doing this tonight is that um, for those of you, in fact, there's hardly anybody on this call who is not close to me. <laughs> is I also want to be blessed. Yesterday, I was telling someone that I was talking with my therapist, and I'm so blessed. One of my therapists, the one I call the intentional therapist, she's on this call, and the whole essence of rediscovering you, like I said, is for us to find pathways through which we can thrive in the midst of the challenges that we all face. Every single person on the panel tonight. If I were to give them three hours, it wouldn't be enough for them to tell their stories, right? So the whole essence of this is, is you're not looking at people who, who have arrived. We, the, the reason we are here is because we've chosen to be here. And I, I always make sure I repeat it every time because once you see people, you know, you see these fine um, flyers that we produce in your mind, you know, this is how they are on a daily basis, but we know better. So when we come to rediscovering you, we keep it real. Uh, everything I do is from a trauma-informed perspective, right? So when we see people behave uh, in a certain way, what we always ask is what happened? Again, when you are going through trauma, there are two things that happen to you. I can assure you, people will judge you. But it's okay to be judged because they don't walk in your shoes and people will diagnose you. They will tell you why what is happening to you is happening to you, but they can never give you any answer. If you try it, go and ask Job's friends. So no matter what you're going through tonight, I want you to know that there is an opportunity. Even if you're smiling through the tears, I give you a testimony that for six years, each time I wanted to cry, my tears just stop here. Like, like if you can see me, they stop here. It's not up to two months that I was able to cry. And I was crying and I was thanking God that I was able to cry. Think about it. So people go through a lot of stuff and many times there's really nobody to talk to. And I can tell you, anybody that I bring on this, it's not a show. Anybody that I bring on this, um, this space, I can tell you that you can actually talk to any of them. So with that, I welcome you to tonight. Again, we have five speakers and then that speaker included me, but I, I've chosen to remove myself and facilitate. There's gonna be five, four perspectives and four speakers and they're gonna have like 10 minutes or thereabouts um, <laughs> to, to share on their favorite topics. Okay, so let me know what your take is on what I have <laughs> on the, I don't want to spoil this. Let me know what your take is on what I have on the screen. Type in the chat box, please let me know what you think, right? While I keep on admitting people. I'm gonna give a minute, just think about it and um, tell me what, what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Please let's let's go to the chat box and let's have some conversation about this um, about the slide that you're looking at. You know, yeah. Let's just tell me tell me what you think on the slide. And Titi is joining from Ibado, uh, Chichi from Lagos. What what do you think about? You can't see my screen. Okay, let me share 
again. Let me share my screen again. Please, if you can see my screen, then let me know. Let me share one more time. Sorry about that. Okay, please, uh, in the chat box, let me know if you can see my screen now. Let me check. He has already captured the book. Okay, I can see it. I can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will need to mute everybody. Please, <laughs> Please mute yourself. Okay, I'll have to mute everybody. That sounds like my daddy's voice. That's my brother. I know his voice even in my dream. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the chat box. Please, what do you think about this thing on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie's laughing. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> what do you <laughs> what do you think? What's your take? The correct spelling is S-C-H-O-O-L, not S-C-H-O-O-L. Some people put the second O before the first O, which is very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I need just two more. Let me see if I have any more. Um, <laughs> for real? <laughs> like seriously? Yes. <laughs> that's, the, that's actually the whole essence, right? Yeah, it's a Friday evening and I, I thought that we should relax. I didn't want us to do the identify something in your room or the breathing stuff. I just wanted us to look at it and, and have some fun. Anyway, you're going to get the slides so you can you can continue to, to smile about it. Um, so again, like I always say, no man, I don't believe in uh, what my father used to say. Some people say they are self-made. I don't believe in, in self-made people because we are all here and it is it is the comfort that we receive from the challenges, the failures and the successes that we go to that we also use to help others, okay? So I always, I will always share about my mentors. I know some of you, I'm sounding like a broken record, but I always do this on purpose to let us know no man ever became what he or she became a woman by the person's self. If you see such a person, I will advise you to run because that's dangerous. We are all here to help one another. So you already, the, 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 the people who come all the time, they already know my mentors, right? And um, there are also people that I'm very accountable to. So again, I sent this out within the week and I don't know how many of you were able to do it. I just wanted it to like break an ice within the week. So if you can go to the chat box, anyone, any of the boxes that you like, right? Uh, what was the best thing that happened to you today? Um, what is that thing that you think you can change about today? And then the other one says, I'm proud of myself today because, and then the other one says, I think I still need to work on. So just take only one in the next two minutes. Let's just see what you think about it. Yeah, different perspectives to issues. Okay, okay, that was about the picture. So this is the final one before we go into um, the program tonight. The thing that happened today, the best thing that happened today, or for me, the best thing that happened today, the best thing that happened to me today uh, is this, uh, this, uh, this webinar. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, yeah. <laughs> That's the best thing that happened to me today. So let's see. Um, best things, I'm proud of myself today because I'm being more intentional about me. Awesome. Um, the best thing that happened to me today, Chiamaka, is having a healthy conversation with my best friend. Awesome. Beautiful. One more. Uh, best thing that happened to me, <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> she said, was shopping and eating pizza. Oh, soft life. Jimmy, I wish. Eh? Jimmy, my girl, I wish. That's soft baby girl life. That's nice. <laughs> okay, let's see one more. <laughs> and for me, I, I, I think I still need to work on stop fixing people. Yeah, Pastor D, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, we, we I get that. <laughs> I, I got you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, so let's get into the business of today, for which I'm so excited about. Um, we're going to be speaking with, this is our favorite. In fact, we need to give Pastor Debbie some, some gifts. It's just that this is a, this is a, an NGO kind of work, but we're going to find something for Pastor Debbie. She's been attending this, this program since we started 13 months ago. She's a Christian minister, a multifaceted executive, a homemaker, and a mentor of youth, of young adults. She's been a marriage counselor for over two decades, and she runs her business, DW, DBW, et cetera. And her passion is to build broken bridges in families. And, and this gave birth to a program, Pass It On, and you know, where she shares traditional Christian core values uh, and how it can be transferred from generation to generation. And that is exactly what she's going to be talking about tonight. Um, and I also always like to brag about the fact that she's a Dhaka Boro's daughter, right? If you, if you live in Port Harcourt, you know, you know about Isaac Boro. Yeah, so this is Isaac Boro's daughter. And I'm always proud to brag about the fact that her daughter made a first class in the UK and she's currently doing her PhD in Cambridge. Yes, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. I know she's very shy, but I always have to brag about her. Thank God. All right. Then we have somebody tonight. <laughs> uh, if I start talking about Pastor Stanley, we're going to be here till tomorrow. So let me just save you until another day. He's a banker, a youth pastor, cross-cultural cross missionary with background uh, training in environmental technology. And he is newly married to one Ajibo lady that I call Princess Amarachi. Mm -hmm. All right. That's Pastor Stanley. And then, oh, I put it to you. Pastor Mayen is a lawyer. She's passionate about emotional health of teenagers, young and young adults. She's a serial entrepreneur, but the one that beats me is that she's a futuristic fashion enthusiast. I never heard this one before. Don't they check my dictionary? Salome, maybe you go help me later. Futuristic fashion enthusiast. CNN has not seen anything. Eh? And she's married and a super mom to three children. I know she's uh, dying from laughter wherever she is. And then, hey, my G, Pastor Ebizimo Koroye, he's a biochemist by training and uh, eventually was the first person who taught me shape and disc. He's a self-awareness coach, those are personality um, assessment tools. He's married with children and currently works in the political space, one person biochemist, one person, self-awareness coach, one person, he works in the political space. And some of those, when I used to do Esli, some of those <laughs> shots that you saw in as I'm somersaulting were actually courtesy of him. And so that's what we have for tonight. And uh, I welcome you all once again. And I will be handing over to uh, Pastor Debbie. Let her do what she knows what uh, to do best, which is to share with us what we should actually be passing on to uh, the next generation. So um, just give me a minute. Let me bring on Pastor Debbie. All right. Yay, Pastor Debbie. <laughs> Let me spotlight you. Okay, Pastor Debbie, over to you. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me. Yes. Like she always yes. says, if you can hear me, go on the chat. Yes, so I have 10 minutes to say this. And there's no better time for us to talk about what we need to pass on to the next generation because if we're truthful to ourselves, we will understand that the times that we're in are scary, like literally, I mean, it's so scary economically, um, you know, the things that are happening, even in the social space, what people are thinking in their minds and our children are beginning to ask, who are they? So I just wanna encourage us as parents, first and foremost, with, I think parents must learn to listen. We must learn to listen and we must be observant in this time and season because um, I had a program on, on um, Saturday.
in the, the third. And while we're having this conversation, you know, a lady came up and she said this, that, oh, you know what, I'm so scared of um, the things that I'm going through. Um, she's a widow. And so that fear had been passed on to her child. Her son is scared. He, he doesn't want to bother her. And so guess what? He was in school and had an issue where he had an infection and he could not call. He told the, um, the, the teachers that he didn't want them to call his mother. You know, and uh, finally they did. And the mom was asking why. And this was what he said. He said, you know what, mom? You know, I know you're bothered. You don't have money. Or, and I don't want you to be worried anymore. I know you're going through a lot. And this child is 12 years old. So sometimes as parents, we pass on our fears. We pass on the worries. We pass on the anxiety. And that's not going to help them. I want us to understand that we need to, in this time, pass on, you know, um, trust. Um, I, I see myself, I wrote something and I said, I'm a, I, I like to fix people and I'm trying to deprogram, you know, someone said, you know, um, how did they say, say to format, I'm trying to just format my system to say, you know what, you can not constantly fix people. And so I saw that play out in my daughter's life. I'm seeing it rather not so I've seen it where she's trying to constantly fix people too. And I'm saying, no, when you fix people, you become so stressed. You become so, you know, you, you're thinking less of yourself and you're trying to want to please people. No, there must be healthy boundaries. So as parents, it's time to teach your children the healthy boundaries and you cannot teach your children healthy boundaries when you don't know how to set the boundaries for yourself. So I have learned how to now format my thinking and say, okay, this is how I need to respond to the, the people around me because you're spending so much time trying to fix someone and the person doesn't want to be fixed. So I said, you know, I need to set those boundaries. No more, I, I need to learn this healthy boundaries so I'll be able to talk to my daughter and say, you know what, these are the boundaries. This is how far you go. So I want to also trust my feelings, trust, myself and in trusting myself as a parent it's easier for my children to see that i trust myself then they can trust themselves what are we having today in the society it's that people don't trust who they are anymore children are saying you know what i i don't feel i'm in a certain way i i feel i'm something else why because they have they've lost that trust so as parents it's time for us to teach them one thing i see also and this time is, res, um, you know, the issue of respect. There are a lot of disrespect in the system. And someone said to me that, oh, you know what, you, Debbie, you like to be respected. And I said, I like for people to respect me, respect my boundaries, as much as I also respect people and their boundaries. And so you can't just come into my space and take total control of my space and make it so uncomfortable for me to leave. And I'm, I'm also, I'm, I get traumatized, you know. So I always teach my children that respect is reciprocal, like they say. So you must learn to respect yourself first. You respect yourself as a, as a young woman. You respect yourself as a young man. And your children will see that in you. And why do I say that? So you see that, for instance, you're married and you're taking all kinds of things as a, as a husband or as a wife. Your husband is treating you anyhow, disrespects you, does not respect your judgments, you know, and all that. And you take that in. The, what you're telling your children is that when they go into the society, people can disrespect them or they can also disrespect people. So it's important that we understand that self-esteem is so important. Like, I didn't feel good about myself when I was growing up. My hair, what am I seeing here? Okay, the hair is behaving so much. Sorry, <laughs> it was distracting me. Now, I didn't feel good about myself. I, I felt like I looked like a male and um, I had a male future, uh, features and nobody would like me and all that. And that played, a, um, it had a lot to do with my, my self-esteem. I, 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 I just felt I wasn't even intelligent enough you know, until I started working on myself because I had the mindset that if I don't conquer those fears, these are the fears that my children will carry. And so I decided to work on myself and believe that I'm good, like I'm a believer. So I always confess I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And um, I decided to focus on my strength. And what are my strength? My strength is 
just creating happiness for people, you know, um, accommodating people in my space and going out of my way to love people and help people. So in doing that, I see that literally playing out in my own kids. Like my daughter is something else when it comes to um, hospitality because I have decided to work on myself, you know, and I, I can say I, I love to be happy. No matter what we're going through, the situation, the trauma that you're facing, all those things won't change. But I tell you something, as a mother and as a father, you must sit down and ask yourself, how do I want to win this battle? Do I want to win this battle in the place of, um, you know, just giving up and in my head, I feel I've won the battle or just saying, you know, this is what life is throwing at me or I'm thinking of the long term. As a parent, I always think of the long term when I'm gone because my heart desire is that yes to come, I should have done all and I'm living this life and my children will be alive. That's my heart desire. But no matter the time that God comes for me, when I'm gone, what do I want to leave behind? I want to be able to tell my children that no matter the battles, you know, you, you, must, you must come to a place where whether I win or lose, I'm going to be happy. Whether I win or lose, I'm just going to be grateful, you know? And so when, when, when our children see us win those battles, rather than giving up on life and saying, you know, this is the situation that we're facing and there's nothing I can do about it. When they see that, I tell you, they will not be able to fight their battles because all they will remember in their head is that, you know what? Oh, mommy was going through this. Our daddy was going through this. And, you know, they never saw you win. You know, they never saw you win. They saw you give up all the time. You, you know, I, I love the scripture, you know, for those of the believers, yeah, I love the scriptures, uh, it, it's in Ecclesiastes, and it says, a living dog is better than a dead lion, and I have always had the scripture in my head saying that, you know what, no matter how powerful a lion is, when that lion dies, a living dog is better than that, so I always say to myself that as parents, we must give children hope, we must, um, we, we must also encourage them in the area of their dreams, no matter what it is, just listen to them. And as you listen to your children, they'll be able, you'll be able to hear and then you'll be able to navigate. You know, you'll be able to navigate and say, you know, I know you want to study this, but can we look at this? I know you want to do this business. Can we look at this? And then you share your experience. Parents, don't be afraid to share your experience. Don't be afraid to share your, your, the times when you fail. Don't be afraid to share the times when you, you win. You know, growing up, uh, you know, you hear parents say that, oh, they never came last in school. They're always tops, you know. But really, that sometimes you didn't do that. So I want to encourage that in this time, parents to try and have a, an open conversation with their children because children are waiting for us to speak to them. Thank you so much. I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Debbie. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I, 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 I wrote down. I, I wrote down what I took from what you said, but I'm not going to. It's not time for feedback yet, and I'm going to give people in the audience time to give feedback. I, I, even if I don't have time to give my feedback, I'm going to keep it. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Like I said today, my job is to facilitate. And thank you so much for doing what you know to do best. So, um, Pastor Stanley, <laughs> I need to see your face. <laughs> Please, can you put on your video so, so that I can, uh, I can pin you? Um, yes. Yeah. Good yes. evening, everyone. Good right. evening, Pastor Stanley. Yeah. You, you know, we, we are always, um, we are always talking and, yeah. and there's a question that I have always been asking. Um, Debbie has asked me that question. Salumi has asked me that question. At some point, we started talking about it until you told me about you, you know, how you grew up. And up to today, I'm not able to match how you grew up with the kind of person that you are because you have every reason not to be the way you are. And I don't want to start going into how you have helped me both in and outside the country. Let's leave that for another day. But the big question that we have for you, why is it that two people grow up 
in the same environment, they go through the same challenges. Maybe an alcoholic father, maybe um, a divorced couple, maybe poverty, maybe a loss. What any form of devastation you can think of. Two people are experiencing the same thing. One person is being taken by the throes of the trauma and another person is not. Thank you. All right, Ma, thank you very much, Ma. Um, I just want everybody to confirm if they can hear me and why I proceed. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for this privilege. And um, the question is very clear and um, straight um, to the point. Um, for me, in fact, when you started by saying I have every reason not to turn out the way I've turned out. Um... Oh, sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry, I've been. Yes, muted. I can hear you now. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was no. uh, somebody. Somebody needs to mute because the the noise was interfering. I was trying to mute somebody. So go ahead, okay. please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So um, when I heard um, the statement you made, um, describing me as um, one who, or oh, you're surprised that I, I turned out the way I turned out. I haven't known my circumstances growing up. Um, I said the traditional response would have been ah. Now God, do we thank God, do you know, as a Christian and all that. But yes, I give God all the glory for that first. Uh, but however, I want to say that there was a question I encountered in um, at a very young age. At a very, very young age, I saw this question somewhere. I can't remember whether it was in a book or I heard it in a seminar or something. And it asks, it says, will the child you are today be proud of the man you have become tomorrow? And... Um, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't sleep on that question. I, I pondered over it and pondered over it and pondered over it. And it um, brought me to a place um, that now leads me further to what I'm about to speak on in response to your question. Why would two people grow up in the same location under the same circumstances and then turn out differently, especially when the circumstances um, are negative? So my uh, major response, using myself as an example, and then, um, you know, in, in, in the course of this explanation or this response, I will try to, you know, share my own story in a very short or simple way. So I like to also share my story because it brings it home. You know, when people know that you're talking about what you've experienced and what you've been through. So um, for me, in a nutshell, because we have 10 minutes, I want to talk so many things, but I would want to just talk on two things that, that are responsible for the outcome of two individuals who grow up or who live in, a, in under the same circumstances and then um, turn out differently. So they grow up, especially under negative circumstances, and then one turns out positively and the other turns out negatively. Um, the, 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 the simple answer I have to that is the choices we make. You know, the choices we make. So um, myself, for instance, I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. And when I mean, when I say dysfunctional home, I mean it in every sense of the word. Um, there, was, there was so much violence in my parents' marriage. Um, for their 28 years of being married, I didn't hear them say I love you to each other. And so it was a toxic setup for a family of four children, uh, me being the second child. And we were Christians, you know, we we're Christians. And um, it was rough and tough you know, growing up. But as a young child, even in my early teens, I came to that point of making a choice. And I said to myself, having suffered what I've suffered, I said, I will never put my children through this. And then I also said that I would want my home to be the exact opposite of what I've experienced growing up. Because I don't want to go into all the details for time's sake, but it was not a palatable one. You know, there was violence, there was abuse, there was anxiety, there was fear and things like that, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing I did was to make a choice. And so my response would, would be the choices we make. And then the second thing I would say would be commitment 
So choices and um, commitments are the two legs on which outcomes stand. So you have a situation and then you have a choice to either act or react to that situation. Now, when you make your choice, you have to commit to that choice and to see it through to ensure the outcome. So for me, I chose that having grown up in a toxic home, I would do my best. I would work at it. I would work so hard to ensure that, you know, um, I don't put my children or subject my children, you know, to the same things I experience. And what did I, what, what, what did this lead me to? It led me to start studying about marriage. It led me to start reading about family. It led me to attend seminars. In fact, anything that had to do with the home, the family, love, those were my go-to topics because I became so interested and passionate about it. And then growing up, I now look back and I can comfortably say to my parents, or oh, my mom is late now, but my dad is still alive, and I can comfortably say to them, thank you for not teaching me or for teaching me what love is not. Because having seen what love is not, I have a better understanding of what love is because sometimes reverse learning is the, is the best way to learn, especially when it comes to experience. So I want to speak about choices, the choices the individuals make. A, a, family, a family or a, a, um, a brother and another brother, two siblings, for instance, growing up under an alcoholic father, one grows up to say, I don't want to be like my dad. Another one can as well grow up and say, oh, my dad was doing two bottles a day. I think I can do better than him. It's a choice. And the circumstances were there, yes. But what choices did these individuals make as a result of what they experienced? How did their experience make them feel? How did, how did they respond to it? Now, some people can go ahead and make these choices, but not walk it through. And that's what leads us to the place of commitment because um, it's not enough to just make choices. And then choices also come in, um, in um, different levels. You can have a big picture choice, but in your day-to-day -day existence, in your day-to-day -day relationship and dealing with life and its challenges, you make sub choices or minor choices that in turn, you know, forms the big picture results that you want. So for example, the one who tells himself, oh, um, I saw my dad leave his life and based it on alcohol. Alcohol was his soulless, -less. alcohol was his, you know, source of joy and made that decision not to go that path. Should be conscious enough to walk through it. He should be ready to pay the price to avoid, I'm just using alcohol as a case study for instance, okay? So that um, it, it, there's, a, there's a balance. And so you should be conscious enough to avoid that path. You know that this was the weakness that you saw in your father growing up. Okay, why even go close to that in the first place? You saw that your father was a chronic womanizer growing up. You know, why venture into that path? Now, oftentimes what we see is people grow up and they make these vows and promises to themselves. I will never be like that. I will never do this. I will never do that. Why? Because they saw it growing up and they detested it. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day outplay of working out the choices that you, know, you have made, this is where commitment comes in. So it is not enough to make a choice, but what matters is committing to that choice. And with commitment comes perseverance, endurance, discipline, you know, being disciplined enough to deny yourself you know, um, present pleasure for future benefits. So most times people say, um, I don't want to do this. Yes, they've come to the place of making a choice. That's the choice. They've chosen not to do it. But choice, making the point of making a choice is the beginning of the journey. Commitment now becomes the vehicle that ensures your arrival at the desired results in that journey. So yes, you get a lot of people. I, I know people you know, far and near, even within the family, that growing up or maybe two, three, four, five years back, there were things we sat down together to talk about. And there were things that we looked at and we detested. Two, three years down the line, you see these same people 
who made these choices, who talked about these things in, you know, in a, in a negative light, now leaving out the same things that is so much detested, not because they enjoy it, but because they were not willing to pay the price to be disciplined enough to follow through, to follow through that choice that they've made. Remember the question as a young child, remember the question that changed the game for me. Will the child I was yesterday be proud of the adults or the man I have become tomorrow? And so every day when I'm faced with life's challenges and I'm faced with, like I said, layers of choices, the big picture choice, the big picture choices, let me use it from a family perspective. I want that to be that loving, caring husband, you know, the available father, the, the God-fearing man, the ideal man, and having an ideal and a, an ideal and then peaceful home. You know, that has been my big picture goal. But there are basic things that I need to do to ensure that that picture comes to pass. And it boils down to my own um, choices, my own actions. And so, like I said, I began to read, I began to study, I began to attend seminars and all that. I began to make choices that will ensure that, I mean, rather take steps that will ensure that that big picture comes true. So um, yeah. choices and... <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Stanley, see, my paper is full. I said, like, this is just like a teaser, but there, there are two things I want to reflect on. And I'm so... I froze when you started to speak because I wish everybody on this call and have an opportunity to meet you. That's my prayer that everybody on this call will have an opportunity to deal, have it, have something to do with you, whether it's in the bank or in the church or just norm, on a normal day. And um, you, first of all, thank you for sharing, right? Um, that, this is the essence of this platform that people feel safe enough to share. It's a place where nobody's judging you, nothing, that we're not perfect. We are just trying to ensure that what we go through in life does not kill us and that mm. somebody else is blessed. Tell me that decision you said you made when you were nine years old. <laughs> well, um, I told myself, you know, the decision, is like I, I was just going there in terms of marriage, family life, and I told myself that I will present, you know, this is this is also still on choices now. I told myself that I will present the best person to anybody that I'm meeting because having been where I was as a child, I I observed and I, I noted that if everyone made the effort of packaging themselves, of refining themselves, of improving their character, you know, of acquiring, acquiring the necessary disciplines. It is not so much about who you marry. It is more about who you are. So I made a decision from age nine that I would present the best person to anybody at all that I meet in this life that will eventually become my spouse. So that drove me to continually or to con consciously, let me use the word consciously, work on myself. Does it have to do with, you know, character flaws? I'm not saying I'm perfect, you know, but that consciousness is there. Am I presenting the best person, you know, to, to my spouse? Am I, it's, 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 it, it, let me put it in the words of Gary Chapman. Gary Chapman said, Gary Chapman is a popular marriage counselor. He said, um, it is far important to be the right person than to marry the right person. Now, I'm just using marriage as um, a case study, mind you, because this transcends to every other field of life. So I'm telling myself unconsciously or consciously rather that I am responsible for the way I act and I react to situations. I'm responsible for the way I relate with people. And so having made that choice to present the best person, to be the best person to whoever I will meet, I committed to working it out step by step, character development, you know, um, building my discipline consciousness and things like that. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, but, you know, when you told me that you took a decision at nine years and I'm like thinking, 
nine years. What was I doing when I was nine? Like the, the environment must have been so, so traumatic for you to be able to make that decision. And I want yeah. to say it, I'm so proud of you. And it's so important for young people to have people that they, they, they are going to be looking up to. And I'm really happy that I, I met you. This is not a church thing. I'm talking about even in business and even in general conduct. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. And definitely you're going to be coming, coming over and over and over and again. All right. So we will, we, we will, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank so you for I will having call me. On, um, he says I should not be calling him pastor. So I will call on Koroye. Um, <laughs> I don't want him to, I don't want him to charge me. Uh, so I'll call on Koroye. And after his session, we'll have a 10 minute reflection time. So please, if you, and it's an open floor, you can even reflect on something that we are not discussing, right? That's going to be for five minutes. So I'm just going to look for the first five hands that come up before we now end up with Pastor Mayen. So, Koroye, it's yeah. up to you. <laughs> okay, so I, I, have, I have 10 minutes, right? Yes, you do have 10 minutes, yes. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> um, you mentioned that I should talk about what my father told me. Yes. All right. If you if you um, choose to talk about any other thing, it's still okay. But I want to talk about quickly something that um, is a fallout of what my father did not tell me. Uh -huh. you know? Good. Yes. Um, you know, I'm I'm gradually approaching fifty. You know, and um, one of those days I looked at my uh, pictures, pictures of church and some other environment. And I discovered that everybody that had some baby face and baby faces and all that were all changing gradually. Um, like Pastor Debbie will say, the baton has been passed on to us. We are now the parents and then, um, and, uh, and we are now, responsible for some other people. You know, a lot has changed. And I looked at my parents, the life that they lived, and it started instructing me in certain directions. And, and there are very many things I wouldn't want to repeat itself in my own generation. And, um, and those things are the things I want to highlight today or highlight quickly, and then maybe stir our minds in those directions, you know? Um, my parents have been married for this, this will be their 40, 49th year married, but um, they spent almost 30 years of their life fending for their children, fending to take care of their children. And they did that so well, judiciously, they, was, they were religious about it, they worked very hard. That worked very hard, mom worked very hard. And I'm sure they worked with the mindset that when they are old, when they are aged, they would have themselves. Um, and then there will be children, still children around or grandchildren around. And a lot of dreams they had, or they will still be healthy, they will still be as strong as they are when they were 30 or 40. And all that. But as time went, life started happening. Things started changing. You know, health issues started coming in. And then when the children left home, the question now came, who are we? They started asking themselves questions. You know, it was clear to them that they didn't even build a bond amongst themselves. And I think this, this particular scenario um, repeats itself across board everywhere. You find that people spend most of their lives as couples working so hard, and then it gets to that point where you want to relax and you discover that the companion is not there. You don't know each other. It, you discover that you have not built what it takes to enjoy your old, your old age. 
You know, so so I'm, I'm I'm very concerned today. My father is my father is suffering from um, dementia today, and doctors told me that part of part of why he's suffering from dementia is because while he was young, he exposed himself to so much stress, mental stress, and all that. So I'm asking, how many people are taking care of their mental health as we stand, as we speak? How many people are concerned about what their mental state will be when they are 70, when they are 80, from 40, from age 40? How many people are considering what their health status will be when they are 50, 60, 70? You know, what, what, how many people are thinking of whether they have friends, whether they are making friends or whether they just have colleagues and um, associates? You know, because one of the issues that's troubling my parents today is they don't have any friends around. They don't have old people that, that, that um, started life with them maybe at some point in their youth. And they don't have those again. They can't, they can't, they can't relate. They can't. So the, once the, um, the, the, that thing that keeps them busy, maybe they walk, or whatever it is, once that thing is taking off, you see that they just begin to deteriorate. And very many people are still falling into these cycles. So these days, I, I take my time now to talk to young people, people of my age, on how to prepare for, for, the, for, for aging, for old age, how to prepare financially for old age, how to prepare emotionally for old age. Because I noticed something with my own mom that, um, herself and her husband, my father, had several issues while they were young, but these issues were not properly resolved. Now in old age, she's battling with those issues. My mom particularly, she's battling with those issues. She can, she's finding it difficult to forgive because they're coming back not as young, not as um, fresh, um, not, not as young um, issues, but the issues have now become mature. They have now aged with them. So they are more difficult to resolve. And a lot of, in fact, I had to separate them because oof, it was getting too difficult to manage. I had to put them in different homes and all that. So we have, to, I'm, 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 I'm now passionate about people talking about their emotional life, how they are able to and do what they are doing about their emotional state currently and how it will affect them in old age, how they are, what they are doing about their network, their friends, people they, are, so they call them um, associates, how they are dealing with their health and um, um, the, the kind of meals they're taking, exercising and all that, um, how they are dealing with um, um, their spiritual life, their psychology, how they think, and a lot of others. So um, this is what I've been, I've, been, I've been talking about, I've been dealing with in recent times. And I particularly have taken steps to um, put myself in, a, in, in order. I've, 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 I've looked at my diet, I've changed my diet. I've looked at my exercise routine. I've added some good exercising routine. I, I, I'm, I'm, if you look at me now, I'm very trim. You know, I take a lot of water. I've looked at my, my emotions. I've started confronting issues that I felt I swept under the carpet. Um, and we're talking about them and we're looking at them and resolving them. You know, I started making friends, increasing my circle of friends, increasing my network, and ensuring particularly that it's not just localized to um, work or church or one, one particular uh, thing about my life. I'm, 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 I'm making friends across board, you know? And then I'm taking time to rest well, to, to, to I'm, I'm taking time out with family, to relate to children and make sure they are, they are not too distant from me. Like my parents did, they focused on the work. We didn't have so much father and, and children, parent time. I'm creating more time for that. And I'm creating more time for my wife too. Um, we talk more. I, I get into um, details about her day and things that are 
maybe that may be insignificant, you know, look at those things and all that. All this is to ensure that trusting that God grants us life, all this is to ensure that um, old age becomes beautiful. You know, old age becomes beautiful. So this is where I will stop for now. Madam. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I've just been writing and I've been typing and I don't know who else is writing and typing, but I'm sorry, but it's a bit scary though. <laughs> it's a bit scary? scary because I'm already 50 and above and these things are real. This is not about demon from father's house or mother's house. These are real. And you can't over-spiritualize it. You can't delay it. You can't, for instance, I'm very slim. So I need to become a bit slimmer. No comments from anybody, please. I'm very... <laughs> Debbie, you're laughing. I'm very slim. So also, please let me also, also show my own water because... Uh, <laughs> this water thing, you know. So thank you so much. And I, I keep on saying thank you because the whole essence of this platform is getting people to share. In, in the last a few years ago, people, you, you wouldn't have said what you said about your parents. Stanley wouldn't have said what he said about his parents because it's like, who had, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm saying that people have the right to judge you because they've never been in your shoes. So we, we allow them to judge. But we are moving, getting better every day. So, you know, judgment is something that I'm very familiar with now. People diagnosing how you should have, why you should not have, how it's supposed to be, just all those theoretical things. And I'm, I keep on saying to myself, I never bring people together to tell them theory. And I'm so grateful that you're able to share from the heart. So I will also need to take your uh, permission from everybody here. Um, this is already 8.57. Please give us another uh, 15 minutes, exactly 15 minutes, please. Thank you so much. So I'm going to uh, give five, a five-minute interlude um, where people have an opportunity to, um, to reflect. We've been, you know, we've been talking and talking and talking. So please, um, like I said, the first five hands, and it's just like uh, for a minute, each, if we, I don't know if we're going to take take up to five because I'm just conscious conscious of the time budget that you know we allotted. I don't want to take people's time for granted as much as I know that we are you know enjoying the call. So the first hand I saw of is Fidelia Moye. Fidelia, over to you. One minute, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm sorry that I joined so late. I'm just coming back. That's okay. You get the record, um, no Allah. Yeah. Um, my own is not one minute, please. Um, this is this is a story that touched. And then um, the question with, with is directing to the last speaker. Please, I just want to know there's no need of you know, there's no need of hiding oneself or not hiding somebody's issues. Um I don't know how to stay alone. This is me. Right now, the girl that is staying with me, they just called her to come because they were settling something for her and she left my house this night. Since I lost my husband 10 months ago, I have not stayed alone. Even when, when I traveled and I, I, I supposed to be in a, I, even when I traveled and I'm in a guest house, I need to, I, I used to call somebody. Somebody have to be with me. So now that the girl is gone, and I don't know what to do, this night, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to stay alone. I'm such an extra girl. I love people around me. I love to see people around me. And now I am staying, staying alone now, this night. I don't know what to do. So I need help. What should I do? I don't know how to stay alone. What should I do? Thank you. Okay. Incidentally, we have only one hand up, and we are going to take only that question. Uh, Pastor Kar Koroye, do you want to take this question now, or you want me to um, 
you want Fidelia to wait after the call so we can talk? I would prefer that, yes. Okay, so so Fidelia, we 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 will handle that after the call, please. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. And I really, really, you know, I really, really appreciate, appreciate you. Thank you so much. It takes a lot for us to come out this way. That's the whole essence of this platform, that people are able to talk. And I can tell you, you will find solution. There's going to be at least a temporary solution for tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, so because of time, we will go straight to Pastor Mayen. Um, Pastor Mayen, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Very loud and clear. Okay, I, I will be talking about forgiveness. Yeah. Um, for, forgiveness is one very important issue because um, we are the ones that suffer when we do not forgive. Although a lot of us would like to say, well, just forgive, just forgive. Sometimes we trivialize it. It's not as easy as we say it. It's easier said than done. I remember many years ago, I myself didn't have this understanding. I thought that forgiving was a very simple and easy thing to do. I recall I had just started church at the hilltop at the time. And uh, I was a very young Christian and I had noticed a couple of things that had happened. So on one occasion, I had gone to visit um, my dear Gio, my senior pastor's wife. I just gone to pay high court support. So whilst I was there, we were just talking about different issues. And then I, I summoned courage to ask her, how does she deal with church folks when they turn around and stab her and they do stuff and say stuff, you know, and all manner of things that go on. You know, people that you have poured yourself out into, they turn around and they say unbelievable things or act in an unprecedented manner. So I was asking her, how do you manage it? And she laughed, you know, then I was just very young Christian. So I did not even understand the depth of that, that laughter. I'm sure it was coming from a very deep place. And she said to me, it's the Holy Spirit. And she began to share with me an account of how someone had caught her a while back and the pain was so deep and while she was crying, she just told the Holy Spirit, I can't, I don't even know where to start to deal with this matter. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how I can get over it. I don't know how I can take the pain from me. But I know that you're the only one that can help me. Please help me. And she said, while she was crying and talking at the same time to the Holy Spirit, it took a long time, but after a while, it felt like a, a burden had lifted. So, wow, being a young Christian, I'd never had any such encounters before. So it, it, it seemed a bit far-fetched for me, but I will recall that incident many years after when I myself found myself in a similar situation where I was so badly betrayed, things had been said, things had been done, unbelievable things, people that you had shared a lot with, someone that you had thought was a friend, not knowing the person was actually a foe. It was a very painful experience. And it hurt so bad that I found every excuse not to be in the same space with that person. Whilst I prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to help me forgive, I found every excuse not to be in the same space with the person. 
And then after a while, I thought it was gone and done with. Because I had prayed, I had asked God to help me, to strengthen me. I wanted it to go. And so after a long while, I summoned courage one morning. And then, incidentally, this person attended the same church with me. And as I drove into my church car park, that person was the first person I saw. And it was as if someone stabbed me. The pain was, the pain was so bad that I couldn't breathe. And I started crying all over again. And I was like, Holy Spirit, I thought this was over. But, but I thought you had taken the, I thought I had been healed. I thought I had forgotten. I thought I had forgiven. Everything just came all over. It was like a fresh pain, a fresh wound. And I began to cry. I was hyperventilating. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. You know, a lot of people were moving around, but they didn't know that I was almost dying inside my car. And it took a while. After a while, I was able to get a grip on myself and I drove off. I didn't enter the church that day. I went home, cried some more, asked the Holy Spirit for more help. And I think that was the final straw that had broken the camel's back. It was actually after that encounter, I became healed of that pain. And I'm talking about a period over months. In my heart, I believe that I've forgiven this person. So sometimes, People say, I'm sorry. It is easy to say, okay, I've forgiven you. Depending on the incident or the pain or the hurt or the situation or the relationship with the person and what had transpired, sometimes it's a process. Sometimes it's not just a bam, wham, thank you kind of thing. It's not just thank you, God bless you kind of thing. Sometimes it takes a while. Other times, depending, like I said, depending on what it is and what your relationship with the person is, it could be easy and you move on. But here's the thing about forgiving. Because I could have died that day. The pain was so much. So when you move around with the weight of unforgiveness, you're the one dying, not the person. You know, sometimes people can just deliberately want to withhold their forgiveness and say, look, no, 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 no. Like, I, can't, I can't just forgive him or her like that. No, now. No, now. I can't. Do you know what he did? Uh, no, 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 I can't. I, I, I can't just forgive like that. And we actually delude ourselves to thinking that withholding that forgiveness is justified or it would make the person feel the pain of what he or she did. No. That's like committing suicide and expecting someone to die in your place. No. When you do that, you're the one that is hurt. You're the one that is pained. You're the one that suffers. You're the one that goes through a dark place, a dark journey. Sometimes you go through so much mental torture and it affects you in so many ways. It can affect your other relationships, it can affect your health, it can affect your spiritual life. Sometimes it even triggers diseases that you don't even believe 
can commonly make. So forgiveness, as easy and as simple as it sounds, is very deep and it's very important. It may not always be easy, but when you ask for help, when you talk to people, when you ask the Holy Spirit for help, and one thing about forgiveness, when you're traveling the journey of forgiving someone, try not to discuss the matter with people who by your and prolongs the process. They want to make you feel it's okay to be. Yes, why shouldn't you? Why should you forgive him? Why should you forgive her? She didn't do well now, but you're the one that suffers, not them, not the person that committed the offense. So the, 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 the earlier you forgive, the better. Right. Now I had another, sorry, I, I right. had another, another incident that I did not believe I could forgive. I did not believe it. But immediately it happened. The first thing that came was rage. And then someone just, I just heard I believe it is the Holy Spirit because if I had not controlled the rage, probably more damage would have occurred. I just heard someone say, mommy, please forgive. It was not the person that committed the act. Someone, the Holy Spirit must have sent that person. And immediately I looked up, I just said, Lord, take this away. And like magic, it wasn't like the first time that it took so long. So it happens in different ways. Like magic, immediately I listened and I said, Holy Spirit, help me. Take this away. It left. How my emotions turned in a moment is unbelievable. So who is beside you when you're traveling the journey of forgiveness is very important. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Mayen. But I've got like four questions on my phone and you have some here. I don't think, I'm just, I'm just going to, you, you answered one, is forgiveness a journey or a destination? You already answered that it is a journey, right? Another one says, can you still dislike someone slash refuse to associate after you have forgiven? I think there was a, another question I wrote there where I got on my phone. Can you forgive and then deny access? I think that will be the last we take. And then all the other questions I'm going to send to you privately. Can you still refuse to associate with somebody or dislike the person after you have forgiven. It's forgiveness about likeness. Another question I got was around forgiveness and justice, but let's deal with this uh, Debbie's question and then we'll round off because I promised we have two more minutes. So, yeah. hmm. Pastor Mayan, are you still there? I think she's hanging. Okay. Okay. Yes, I'm here. We, we, I'm here. we are not I'm hearing here. you. Yeah. So can you still dislike someone or refuse to associate with the person after you've forgiven? Like I said, it's a journey. It doesn't happen automatically. Now, I, I, I listened to a story of a woman whose son had been killed by another young man. And um, the woman originally wanted the boy to also die. And um, when the matter was taken to court, the family was expecting that the boy would be sentenced to death. Now that didn't happen. The sentence was reduced to manslaughter 
rather than murder. And manslaughter is not um, an executionary uh, conviction. So he was sent to prison. For a couple of years. And I think that um, when it's given them, um, and the woman got more angry and decided to start a crusade and a campaign for the boy to be killed and then uh, sent back to prison or whatever. And in the process of all this, she herself became ill because the burden of having to carry all that pain over the years hurt so much that she became physically ill. And then one day she was in her room and she heard someone just from nowhere, nobody physically present. So it must have been the Holy Spirit said, why don't you let this body go? Why don't you take a rest? And she broke down in tears, similar to my own experience. And she cried and cried and cried, but she still did not let go. She decided to go and visit the boy to ask him why, why he killed her son. And when she got there, seeing him physically, as opposed to the pictures of him that he had, she had seen and the person she had seen during trial, the change was too radical. And so she saw that she did not need to kill this guy. He, he had already died himself severally. And so something in her broke that day. She didn't know when she embraced him. And that was the beginning of her own healing. And together, both of them formed a group and began to campaign on how to help people who had suffered such trauma become healed again. And so the woman has lived for many years after. She could have died earlier if she did not come to that point of forgiving. So yes, forgiveness, of course, if you don't travel a journey, how do you get to your destination? You must travel before arriving at your destination of forgiveness. So, so in other words, um, while so you're on the journey, it takes a process. Yes. So while you're on the journey, you can be disliking the person, but you are forgiving the person or what? You can be disliking the person. Until you are until you're forgiving the person, you can't like the person. That's the truth. It is only when you have forgiven the person that that emotion of likeness can return. Okay. All right. We're not going to finish this conversation tonight and our budget is over. But the last question I have here is that, is it possible, is it possible to forgive uh, somebody who has not asked you for forgiveness? Yes. Is it possible? Yes. Very possible. Like you said, for your you own sake. Even, you mustn't even wait for the person to ask for it. Because forgiveness doesn't matter whether the person is deserving of it or not. So if you're waiting for the person to apologize, it means that the person must deserve it. So for your own sanity, for your own sake, it's cheaper to forgive. All right. OK. Thank you very much. And with that, we, we round up. I knew that today was going to be a bomb. And thank God it's, it's been recorded. And yeah, uh, Nkese says, uh, forgiveness is freeing yourself of a toxic burden. Yeah, I know that forgiveness is easier said than done. I know it. Is, yes. <laughs> because I've had to deal with and I'm still dealing with. So this is not yes. a theory. And we are yeah. going to have another session on this. And it's going to be a conversation where people will just share about their yes, journey. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the person you even need to forgive is yourself, which is a different discussion altogether. That's because okay. sometimes we have, even when God has forgiven us, we still, we, <laughs> we refuse that, that God has forgiven us and we are still suffering from 
things that God has thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. So thank you so much, Stanley. Thank you, Mayen. Thank you, Ebizimo. Thank you, Pastor Debbie. And thank you, everyone who has spent the last one and one and quarter hour with us tonight. We are just so grateful. And I continue to thank Debbie and Salome and uh, Dr. Belema for pushing me to do what I'm doing. I tell you, they literally pushed me to do this because I've been talking about having a safe space for people. I also want to say that from July, we're going to be ha having discussions that people don't talk about. And this is part of what the society, uh, is the societal myths that, pe that people, people put on our mental health. It's going to be difficult conversations, but we have to discuss it. Very serious issues that nobody wants to talk about. Probably the church doesn't want to talk about it, but it's okay. But we have to talk about it so that people will know that they are actually in the right. And if they need to make a right turn, then they make a right turn. But for people to be carrying unnecessary burdens on their hearts, now even having listened to Pastor Koreye, that as we are aging, they said, we can't, we can't afford it. We can't afford to keep on having so many things. No when to say, I can't take this anymore. I mean, even if the person is feeding you, you should know when to say, hey, I'm okay. right now, I can't deal with this. And be bold enough to do that. And, you know, you, you, this mind, this mind, there's just a limit to what our minds can take. Okay. And with that, I would like to say, just drop in the chat box your reflections for tonight. And I'm so, so grateful for your time. I know we've overshot by 20 couple more minutes, uh, but I'm so grateful. Thank you. As usual, by Monday, you get the recording and the slides. Thank you. Good night and God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Let me stop Thank recording. Um, Fidelia, please wait behind uh, Pastor Pastor Korea, please also wait behind just for a couple of minutes.